Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Advanced Angular Lunch. Uh, it's kind of sponsored and, and mostly features people from uh, Oasis Digital here in St. Louis, although locations don't seem to matter much anymore with almost everything online. Uh, this month, we have Lance Finney, a colleague of mine here, who's going to do a very cool talk about NGRX efficiency using this NGRX entity library. I have not personally used the NGRX entity library, so I'm going to learn a bunch today, even if nobody else does. So uh, I appreciate everybody coming and uh, take it away, Lance. All right, thank you. Let me, am I sharing my screen well? Looks great. All right. So uh, thank you, Kyle. As Kyle mentioned, I work with Oasis Digital and I'm gonna be talking about NGRX efficiency with Entity. Uh, in addition to working as a consultant with Oasis Digital, I'm also an instructor with Angular Bootcamp. And I'm also the lead instructor and curriculum lead for our new NGRX class. And what I'm gonna be talking about today is actually something that comes from our new NGRX specific class. So if you like what you see today and you wanna learn more of it, uh, you can sign up. I believe our next public class is going to be online in September. So you can check out our website and look for more detail. But sales done. Uh, now let's take a look at what we're gonna be talking about. So what you see here, what I'm sharing here is the, uh, the standard are a flow diagram that we see for the architecture of NGRX. This, is, this specific one is what we show in our class. And I'm hoping that most people involved in this are familiar or who are attending this are familiar with the components that we see here. Um, just, but I'll give it a really quick refresher just to make sure. Uh, the main parts that we normally think of when we think of uh, NGRX state are the store, actions, reducers, and effects. And the way we, they work together is that the store is where the single source of truth is for our data. And components get information from the store using selectors, so they get an observable view of it. And the way that they change things in the store is not by directly modifying in the, anything in the store, but by dispatching events, sorry, dispatching actions, which are essentially events. And those actions have information. You know, the user logged in, the user logged out, we're creating a book, we're renaming a widget, anything like that, anything that would, uh, change the state of the overall application could be an action. And also anything that is just an event that your system wants to know about could be an action. And the way those actions modify the store is that they're processed by reducers, which are special functions. They're pure functions that take the action in the previous state and decide whether anything needs to change. There's a lot of reducers, so not every uh, reducer responds to every action, but when it needs to change something, we end up as the result, what it uh, returns is the new state of the store and the store takes that and then passes it on to the components that want it. And the effect is kind of on the side. As I mentioned, the reducer is a pure function. It can only get the previous state and the action. So if you want to do anything that involves a service or talking to the back end or asking the user for a confirmation, you have the opportunity to do that in an effect. And the effect can then dispatch another action or continue the flow as necessary. So this is what we're usually thinking about when we think about NGRX state. And I showed you our document, our uh, screenshot for it, um, but we're not the only ones. What you're seeing now is pretty much the same diagram from the NGRX team themselves. You know, they have things slightly organized differently and apparently purple is their color, uh, but it's really the same thing. They also really talk about selector, store, reducers, actions, and effects as though that's all of what we get with NGRX. And for a long time when I was using NGRX, I figured as long as I had these things under my belt, I knew what I was doing and there wasn't really the way to do it better with an NGRX. But in fact, if you look at the NGRX website, over here on the left, there's a, quite a few different things. Store is where this, the store and the reducers and the uh, selectors are from. And then there's effects, which is separate. But there are a few other things down here. Now, NGRX is spreading in what it's doing. And so some of these things, component and component store, don't really have to do with their data state management, at least not directly. So not everything here applies, but some of them are actually things that are built on top of NGRX that help you do things either better or do things more than you can do with NGRX. So the particular ones are router store for interacting with the route, entity, which I'm going to be talking about today, and then data, which is subject for another time. So what does entity give us? What why, what is this extra thing that's part of the NGRX state suite 
but it's not part of the core that we talk about and they talk about. And when would we want to use it? That's what I'll talk about today. So in order to set the stage for this, we're going to be using this fake little blog administration application. Uh, this is the app that we use in our NGRX class and we converted from an RxJS only app to a full-fledged NGRX app over the course of two days. But right now, we're, um, we're looking at it just for specifically for entity. And this is an app that is using uh, NGRX, using all the things that I pointed out on those diagrams. And th the way that the app works is there's a little bit of state up here where we can change the name of our blog. You change it up there and then it's also gets modified down here. We have a group of 10 different users or authors. So we can flip between the authors and change that. The authors, other than being able to change which one we're actively looking at, are not fully CRUD. We can only read them. We're not creating, um, updating, or deleting them. But for each of these users, we have blog posts. And each of them have 10 blog posts. And so we can click on those, and these are fully CRUD. So I can click on here and change the name of the title, and it gets changed immediately. I can change the, the contents of it. I can add a new one, click the plus button. If I scroll down, there we go. We have our placeholder. We, we're adding a new one. And then I can delete any of these. So for posts, this is a full CRUD app. Users, it's not quite a CRUD app, but for posts, it is. And for those of you who are familiar with the dev tools, I'll show this is that app running in our dev tools. So dev tools is not, the, the extension on Chrome is not an uh, NGRX specific thing. <clears throat> It comes from Redux, but there's a hook. One of the things that I showed on the NGRX page was their store dev tools. And that's their hook that allows you to read into this. So it's kind of a time traveling debugger. And we can look in here and see when it was initially, when, when our app was initialized, this was the state. We had a title, we didn't have any users and posts. There were a couple other internal NGRX initialization things. Then our first events to load the users and posts were dispatched to the, um, sorry, to the effects. And then th they made a call to the backend and then those returned with our users and our posts. And now we have an array of users that is populating our data and an array of our posts to populate all our data. And then the cool thing about these tools, if you haven't seen them before, as I said, it, you can, it's time traveling. So you can go through and see as I changed which user was selected, you can see here current user nine, then choose user, current user seven. You can see the state of the application at moment by moment as you're going through. Um, and you can even hit the play button on this and it will play through. And you, if you have another browser window set up, you can show it side by side and you can see your application rerunning all the steps as the state was changed through. It's very cool. Not what I'm talking about, uh, but I just wanted to point that out. All right, so we see what our app is. We see it's this app that has users and posts. There's also a little bit of other data with the title. We're not going to deal with that anymore. So let's take a look at the code on this. So first I'll look at the user reducer. So in this we have um, two different uh, branches of our data, one for users and one for posts. And the user branch has a little bit of state. It's not big, but some useful stuff. We have an array of the users that we have, and then we have an optional number that keeps track of which one is the currently selected user. And that's all the state we have for our users. The way a reducer works is it takes the initial state. So what is our initial state? We have to define it with an empty array of users and no current user ID defined. That's where we started back here. That's how we got to this initial point. Now, the more important part is the reducer. So now that uh, the user interacts with it or there's some, something that interacts with it and creates these uh, events, these actions, the reducer is where things happen to change. So one of our early events that happened was loading users. Nothing in the reducer paid attention to that. But after the call to the back end, we had lose user success. And that calls us here with an action that contains the array of users. So we need to update our state to have that information. And the way that you do that is something like this. We can have uh, a one-liner that returns a new object that is a clone of the previous object. We're using the spread operator to do a shallow copy of the previous state object and then overwriting the users 
with a shallow copy using the spread operator of the new users. And the reason that we do this, the reason that we use the spread operator um, instead of just modifying the state that comes in is because of change detection. Angular and uh, NGRX need to have new objects each time. They need to work with immutable data structures so that when a change happens, it'll see that the change happens by the object itself being a new object, not by the object having something internal to it changed. Angular and NGRX can't tell that the internals change, but they can tell if you swap out an old object for a new object entirely. So that's what we're doing here. We're swapping out a new array for the old array, and we're swapping in a new uh, object for the old object. So it's one line, but it actually, it, it, you know, there's a little bit of complexity here, a couple spread operators. You have to know what's going on with that. But notice, like, we're not actually doing anything that is user specific. There's no real business logic here. It's just how do we handle an array of users? I'm going to come back to that. We have another action here, another reducer, where when the, we choose a user by selecting one in the dropdown, we get a new user ID has been selected. So the action that comes in tells us what our new user is, and we spread out the old state and then override the current user with the user ID that was selected. So that's what we're doing for our user reducer, for our user selector over here. Um, this is pretty familiar uh, for anyone who's been using a NGRX with the uh, since version eight, uh, when they added the action and um, action reducer creation approach. But uh, first we use the create feature selector to select down to the branch of the overall tree that's just for users. And then using that selector, we then get th that state and we can pull out of it the user's array. And so now we have a selector for the user's array. Whenever the user's array is changed, that will feed out a new uh, user's array in that observable. Similarly, when we wanna know what the current user ID is, we use the feature selector to get the base state and then we can return the current user ID. The more involved one is select current user. We don't have, so we wanna get the user object that is currently selected. So we will take the array of current users and the current user ID, we'll combine both of those and then we'll get this little function that takes the array and the user ID and then we can call find, the array prototype find function on it to find the user in the list that has the ID that we want. I'm gonna come back to that. There's a problem there, but I'm gonna come back to that. So, so that's what we're doing with user. Now here's what we're doing with uh, posts. So on posts, it's a, a different branch of the tree, but it's kind of similar in that we are keeping track of this array of posts. Now in this particular implementation at this point, we're not keeping track of the current post in NGRX. It's being handled through the router, so it's not part of here. But so all this has is the array of posts. And then the initial state is just an empty array of posts like before. And then we have a few more behaviors here because this is fully CRUD, unlike, the, uh, unlike users. So the first one is post success. We get in our array of posts, and this looks exactly like we did with users. So we have a few lines of code that are a little bit complicated because we have to worry about the spread and immutability and stuff like that. That is exactly the same. So if we also, in addition to users and posts, we also had books and managers and widgets and this and that, and we, these were all arrays, we would have these four lines of code duplicated every single time. And that's not great. And that is really the first of the two efficiencies I wanna talk about. So the first efficiency is an entity allows you to write less code. It will be more efficient for you. Because already in this tiny app, I've written the same code twice. That's not great. Now let's see, what are the other things that we have in here? Create post success is another one where we're adding a post. So we need to take, um, we need to make a copy of the old state. Then for our posts, we are going to spread out a copy of the old post array and then add the new post to the end of it. So again, fairly simple, but you know, you have to know about spread operators and arrays and things like that. And there's really nothing post specific here. It's just array behavior. For delete, similar thing. The action, we get which ID has been deleted. So we spread out the state and then we, our post is now a new array that is created by filtering the old array 
to exclude the elements that had the ID equal to the one we're deleting. So create, you know, creating a new array that has everything but the one to delete. And again, nothing post specific. This is just array behavior. Finally, update post success. Now this is the one that I really don't like to write, but I've written it several times in the course of my career. So in this case, one of the posts could be the first one, could be the last one, could be one of them anywhere in the middle has been changed. And so we need to create a new array that's the old array with that one value swapped in. The action that we're going to get has the new post in it, has the updated post. So we wanna swap that in in our spot. So we need to figure out the index. Where is it? Is it the first one? Is it the last one? Is it somewhere in the middle? We can get that index. And if it actually exists in there, then, well, we're going to create our new state by shallow copy of the old state, then create our posts by a shallow copy of all the parts of that array before the one that we're looking at, then inject the new thing, and then put all the ones after it. And I've written this code several times, and I don't like it. Because I always forget with slice. Is it Okay, inclusive and then exclusive. Are they both inclusive? Are they both exclusive? Pretty much every time I use slice, I get it wrong the first time and then I have to, you know, play around with it. Like this code needs unit testing because there's a lot of little things here that aren't that hard, but it's easy to get wrong. And I you know, 15 lines of code for something that again, there's no business logic here. This is not anything specific to a blog or post or users or anything like that. It's just array management. And then finally, for the selectors over here, again, we do a feature selector to get that branch. We can select out the posts the same way we did selecting out the users. Selecting an individual post is pretty much the same that we're finding in an array, except it's passed in to the selector instead of uh, selected internally. And then the final one, this is really the only thing that feels like it actually has a business logic. It, it's knowing that there's an association between posts and users. So we're filtering down the array of posts that we get only to the ones where the user ID is uh, the one that we have passed in. So if I say user ID three, I only get the posts for that user. But this is what we have. Again, very little of this is business logic, but I, had, I have duplicate code between two different reducers that I have. What if I had 15, 20 of these? I'd have duplicate code everywhere. And what if I have 15 or 20 that are fully CRUD? And I have these 15 lines of code that are duplicated everywhere. This is what Entity can help you with. So, well, I'll go over and look at the website for Entity first. So Entity describes, is described as an adapter for managing record collections. It provides an API to manipulate and query Entity collections. So we have collections. These arrays of users and posts are our collections, but what do they mean by Entity? In this case, an Entity is defined as an object that has a unique ID that is either a string or a number. And so our users and posts both qualify. They both have an ID field. If we go look at a definition of post, it has, an, uh, there we go, it has uh, an ID field that's a number and user has an ID field that is a number. Both of those are, are uniquely defined by their IDs. So now that we have an array of things that are uniquely defined by IDs, we can use Entity to do all of this management, all of this array-like behavior, have it do it for us instead of us having to rewrite it every single time we add another collection to our app. So let's see it in play. So I have a tag here for after Entity. So I'm gonna switch over to the new one. All right. So here we see the code written in an entity way. This is, I'll look at the user reducer first. Entity gives us an adapter and a state and a way to create the adapter. So let's take a look first at the state. So if you remember before, the state interface for this had the array of users and this current user ID. Well, entity state is managing that data structure of users for us. It's managing that collection of users for us. So we don't have to specifically define it. But this on line 14 shows that we're adding some other state in there, the current user ID. We're not limited only to that one thing that it's managing for us. We can put whatever other state we want to in there as well. So that array of users is replaced by having it extend entity state, and then we can do whatever else we want. And like before, we'll have an initial state. 
but we're not going to define our initial state all on our own. We can use the adapter. So the, the adapter is defined right here. So we're saying, I want an adapter that is specifically for user. So it just needs to be, you can use the uh, generics to say whatever adapter type you want and you can pass that in. And then you can create this as, I want to have an adapter for user. And then it takes care of defining the initial value of your collection. You don't have to specify an empty array in there. It takes care of defining the initial empty value. And then again, anything else that you do on your own, you can add in. So what does this look like for the reducer? We have the same reducers as before. And in fact, the choose user reducer is identical to before because it's not managed by entity state. That's that there's nothing different there. So if we had a whole bunch of other custom reducers, we could do anything we want. That's normal. But for the one that is behavior that is just dealing with arrays, well, we can use an adapter. So that adapter has a function on it called set all. So we can pass in our users from our action and then pass in the state and it will take care of the rest. We don't have to worry about the spread operator and remembering to do that immutability and all of those issues. It's just done for us. I probably would have written a unit test for the previous time for this one. And it's probably up to your team policy whether it's worth writing a unit test for something that just calls something else that is well tested. I might not even need a unit test. I have to write less code. That's a good thing. So that's what we have in our user actions. This is, I mean, I think it's only one line shorter in here. So it doesn't seem like much, but we'll see later a bigger advantage. For our selectors, it's a similar situation. We, we use the same create feature selector as we did before. That didn't change at all. But when we want to select out our array of users, we again, based on that feature selector and then pass in something. But previously we had to define our own. We had state dot, uh, state arrow, state dot users or whatever. Yeah, we had to put our own thing in here. Well, the adapter gives us a few different selectors out of the box that we can use for common things. And the select all will just select out that array for us. So we don't even have to write that. I like that. Now select current user ID, that's the same as before. Select current user. This is the one, if you remember, where we grabbed the actual object out of the array. This one's a little different. And I, I'm gonna come back to that because this is more about the second efficiency. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail here yet. Let's look at the, uh, the posts. Now in the reducer, the interface is even simpler because this didn't have that extra bit of the current item. So the interface is just the entity state of the post. Like it's taking care of all of the definition of our state for us. Again, we have an adapter that is using generics to say it's for post. And our initial state is really just give me the initial state. You pass in an empty object in there and you have everything you need. For a reducer, again, the first one was load post success. And now the same code that we had in the users we have here. So that's great. It's one line of code that we don't have to write that is well tested, somewhere else did it, that's great. How about creating a post where we're adding one? Well, there's a function on here to add one. So we pass in the new post and we pass in the state and it takes care of the rest. I don't have to think at all about spread operators or mutability. Delete post success, I pass in the post ID, it finds it, I remove one. Now there's a whole bunch of these. So, there's add all, add many, add one, remove all, remove many, remove one, set all, set one, update many, update one, upsert many, and upsert one. Upsert's kind of a funny word. It's updated if it's already there, otherwise add it. So all of these really common things that are not just how you deal with collections, it takes care of it for you. You don't have to write it. And where we really see the advantage is this one liner that replaces 15 lines of code that we had before. So update post success, the API is a little more complicated because they're giving us the ability to say, I only wanna update this one field or update another field. In, in this case, because of the way the application overall is written, we're just completely replacing the post. But this is flexible enough that we could update only the title or only the body or only this or only that. Um, so that it's a little bit more complicated than these other ones up here. But overall, I'd much rather have this one line of code than the 15 lines of code that I had before especially if I have 20, 30, 50 different 
entity arrays in my application all over the place, I would much, much rather have this than what I had before. And finally, for post selector, nothing really new that we haven't talked about. There's still the same feature selector to grab out the overall slice of the data. The create selector, we can use select all. That's again coming from the adapter. If we want to select an individual post, well, this is the same thing that I wanted to hold off on for users. I'll come back to that in a moment. And here's the, uh, the select posts by user. This is the same as before. We select posts to get that array, and then we filter it down to the ones we want. So I hope that demonstrates what I consider the first major efficiency, writing less code. You know, as, as I said, in this tiny app, it's not it's not as obvious as it might be, but I've worked, worked on an app before that had dozens of these arrays of, uh, of entities. And I wish that we had been using entity at the time because we had those 15 lines of code duplicated dozens of times throughout the app. And all of that could have been replaced by one line of well-tested bulletproof code from the library. So that's the main thing. You save yourselves a lot of time. So what's the second efficiency? faster searches. So now I'm going to come back to this selector. So the other selectors behave the same way, but this one behaves differently. Compared to the before case, it has changed. In the before case, we had, we, we were combining the results of two different selectors, one that brought in the array, and then one that brought in the user ID. We still have one that brings in the user ID, but this first one doesn't get an array of users. What it actually gives us is the user entities. It gives us a dictionary of users. And a dictionary is really just a map of um, the string ID to a user. So what's going on here? Where, where is this dictionary coming from? So to learn that, let's go back to the dev tools. When we initially create this now, I was careful never to say that it was automatically creating the array of users and array of posts for us, because that's not how this data is stored. We get two different data structures to replace the one array that we had when you do it yourselves manually. So the initial version, when it's empty, it's an empty array of IDs and an empty entity object. Let's go down here to see the populated to see what's going on. What happens is when those all of those functions, um, add one, add many, set all, all of those things, whenever any of those get called, internally it's doing a conversion. You're passing in an array, but it doesn't keep it as a single array. It converts it one to an array of IDs, and so it's a tiny, tiny array, and I'll come back to this in a moment. But the more interesting one and the more useful one is this object map of identities, or of entities. So previously, as you know, it would have been an, uh, an array where, you know, zero to this item, one to this item on our way through. But now it's a map where the key is the ID and the value is the property itself with the same ID number. So why does this matter? It matters a lot for running time of your code. So I wrote this blog post uh, a few months ago called NGRX is 40 times faster than your code. Find out why. Admittedly, it's a bit of a clickbaity title. But the point is, um, and I encourage you to read this. I'll put in a link at the end of the, uh, in the references at the end of the presentation. Um, point is, go through and show some examples of these, of how um, using different approaches take different amounts of time. So I, as I said, I encourage you to go read this, but I also have it running live. So here is the a little um, script that I wrote that is the basis of the numbers that are in that blog post. So what we have here in the bottom is I imagine that we had an Olympics where first Olympics, there was only one country and one athlete. And so we put, we create an array of one athlete and an array of one country and it took 0.234 milliseconds to find a the country that each athlete was associated with. And the next Olympics was a lot bigger. There were 10 countries and 10 athletes. And so for each athlete, it did a find through the country array to figure out what country it was part of. And it took a little bit longer. 
A hundred took a little bit longer. A thousand actually took less time. There must be some sort of internal uh, efficiency going on. I'm not sure what, what's going on, but it's kind of cool. But then 10,000, it's about 10 times as long. And 100,000, it's about 10 times as long again. So what's happening here is when we're using the basic approach of having an array, and let's say we have 100,000 countries or athletes, and we need to find for each athlete which country it's in, then it means for each of those 100,000 athletes, it needs to search through the entire array of countries. Now, it may get lucky. You know, this is random data, so every time I run it, it's going to be different numbers. But we may get lucky, and that athlete is in the first country that it searches. We may get unlucky, and it's in the 100,000th. We may get really unlucky, and it's not in there at all. Um, but even when the, there is a match, on average, on, in our data, with a random data set, with 100,000 countries to search through, it's going to take 50,000 evaluations because it checks the first one, and then the second one, and the third one, and so on, and forth, until it finds it. So on average, it's going to have to go through half the list. When you only have 10 countries, well, it's looking on average five times. Not a big deal. If you have 100,000 uh, countries that you're searching 100,000 times, that is a big deal that you're doing 50,000 searches 100,000 times. That's like 5 billion searches or something. My math might be wrong off the top of my head, but we're doing a lot of searches. And you can see that we end up scaling our time. This is called, in computer science, we call this a big O of N problem. As the problem space increases, the amount of time it takes to process it increases the same way. But I also did the exact same search using the entity approach. We're creating the entity object, just like what I showed before. And when there's only one country, it takes about the same amount of time. 10 countries, a little bit less. But as we go up, the improvement in time is huge. In this case, it's about 1 20th of the time. And the, when I wrote the blog post, I had an example where it was 1 40th of the time. Uh, maybe it's a different computer, I don't remember. But 1 20th of the time um, to run all the way through this. And the reason is when we search for something in an entity, in an object like that, when we do a search like this, or we're not a search, we're, we're not searching through, we're not going through one by one by one to get it. It's just going to that spot and grabbing it. It doesn't matter how big um, the, the object is. If you have one object with one element in it, or a million objects with a million elements in them, when you are searching just by the property name, it is the same time, it's no slower. And so this is a big O of zero. As our problem space grows, the time it takes does not. Now that's not entirely true. You see that the time grows here, but actually most of that time, almost all of the time is of building the entity map. There's a one time hit to convert that array to the entity map. But after that one time hit is done, every time we do a search, it's lightning fast. Every time we do a search, it's just, it hits it and we're done. So um, this matters a lot for some systems. It might not matter for you. If all of your arrays are tiny, or if you only search occasionally, it doesn't really matter. This is not an efficiency you're gonna care about. But if you have large arrays that you are doing this type of search through, and you do them frequently, using this entity approach can save you a lot of time or save your users a lot of time. And so that is why the entity team implemented it that way. They're not the first ones to invent it, but uh, they, are, they use it well. So that's why we have the entities array, or entities object. The reason we have the ID array in here is because there are times that we need to keep track of the order that we put these users in. We want them to appear in the same order. We want our posts to appear in the same order. So this array just keeps track of what order the elements are in there by their ID. And so if you want to find what is the fifth uh, en entry in there without knowing what its ID is, you can go here to the four to get the five out and then use the entity. It's a lot quicker than having to chug through one by one by one. So that is why this here, collect current user ID, we grab our entities, we grab that dictionary, and then it's an incredibly quick check. Whether we're looking at our users or whether we're looking at our posts, these finds are much, much faster when we use our entities, when we use the array map to search, sorry, an object map to search instead of arrays. So those are the two efficiencies that we gain. You write a lot less code. 
because someone else has already written the code for you. You don't have to write any of this code for just standard array manipulation that you would have to do otherwise. And for your users, especially when you have large data sets that needs to be searched a lot, your users will thank you for having a faster, more efficient application. So that's my presentation. Uh, resources here at the end. The first two are links to information in NGRX itself. The third link is to the blog post that I showed. The app itself that I'm using here is available on Bitbucket and I start with uh, an app that's all RxJS and by the end I'm using NGRX data and you could look at the diffs and see step by step by step as it changes through. And then the final is a link to this presentation itself. So uh, thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? I'll throw you a softball to get it started. Okay. While other people thinking of hard questions. In there, you use the thing called the dictionary, capital D. Yeah. I've used the, a map in, in, a, in TypeScript, which I could suggest JavaScript map. What's a dictionary and how's it different from a map? So a dictionary, I believe, let me. So a dictionary is uh, just how the NGRX team uh, defines their thing. So it's essentially, it's like a record. Um, the record is this standard TypeScript thing. And so a dictionary is essentially NGRX wrapper of record for a string to uh, whatever. It, so it, it's just using a JavaScript object as a mapping versus like using that, that map type. It might be limited browser support or something. Yeah, I, I can't tell you why they made that specific choice, but this is essentially just a record. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Hopefully others will have questions also. Hey, uh, you answered most of my questions as I was writing them down. Cool. Um, but uh, so did you do your performance test on the updates? Because uh, it seems like you might have a little bit of the same um, find issues when you're, if you're doing an update where you have to maintain the array and the, the map or the, uh, the dictionary? Uh, yeah, that's probably true because uh, on the update, you know, we're doing this find by index. So the same problem would apply. I have not micro benchmarked that to find out. I was only, I only did the select essentially, but uh, yeah, probably it's the same issue. You're right. Okay. Yeah, that's, Everything else, uh, you're like answering them as I was writing them down. So, good. It's uh, it's that's something like I kind of was always confused about with um a lot of the NGRX stuff is all the spreads and stuff, and I always wondered about the performance impact, but never stopped to like dig in and, and care. So it's awesome that you you went through and kind of outlined why yeah. you do this. Yeah, there's not, spread itself is not a performance problem. Uh, spread is really fast, uh, but the, just the performance problem comes in with having to do the find a lot. Um, spread is good and internally within the set all they do uh, uh, either a spread or a um, object out of sign. I don't remember which one, but yeah, they do something similar. So like those mechanics are really just converted into someone else's code that you don't have to deal with. Um, but it's having the different data structure internally is what is the performance gain. Awesome. It looks like there's a question in the in the text chat. Okay, let me, I do not see that. Um, give me a moment. Uh, oh, there we go, okay, found it. Would array prototype map be better in this case? Uh, Ciao. Uh, so that's my question. Uh, I was I was referring to uh, when you do the update before the entity. Okay, let's go take a look at the code. So wh what I normally do is I just map over the the post. If I find if I find the uh, the ID matches the action dot post dot ID, I will spread that post with the action dot post. Otherwise, I just return the current post without doing the fight index in slides? I've never done it that way. Um, that makes sense. I, uh, yeah, I, I've never done it that way, but I, you definitely could. So uh, I have another question. Sure. I've known of uh, NGRX entity, but I never used it because mm -hmm. again, I, I'm not convinced 
I'm not convinced. So you, you bring up the case where you, you have like the fine, where you have the, um, if you use the entity, you can, you have the O1 when you find a, a record. Mm -hmm. But however, as, an, as far as I remember, if I remember correctly, the create selector uh, is memoirs. So if you have the same ID, that, that will be cached for you. So. so so it does memoize. So each time you search for a particular ID, so, so the second time you search for a particular ID, it will be lightning fast. But the first time you search for a particular ID might not be. Because the first time you search for any particular ID, it might, and let's say you have a million records, on average, it's going to have to do 500,000 evaluations. Mm -hmm. um, now, the second time, it won't have to do any evaluations because of the memoization. But that first time will be a hit. So then, then what, about the, uh, what about the cost of NGRS entity turning your arrays into an entity in the first place? So yeah, there is that hit and that is the one cost that we get, but it is a one-time hit um, and it's up front. Okay. Um, so you know, that's what I showed here that overall, even with that one-time hit, it, when you have a large enough array uh, that is checked enough times, then it is worth it. Um, you know, it's not going to be worth it in every case. Uh, if you have tiny, tiny arrays that you're dealing with, or they're only searched very rarely, yeah, it's, it's not going to win you much. But if you have big arrays that are searched a lot, it will win you something. In another way, it would not be worth it is I worked on a project before. Um, maybe I already said this, I'm not sure. But I, I worked on a project once where we used NGRX, but we didn't actually use uh, we thought about using Entity, but it made no sense at all for us because mm -hmm. on that project, we were essentially using NGRX just for the, um, for the effects and really using it for uh, the pub sub system that comes with the oh, actions. Okay. Um, we did a little bit with the data storage, but the data storage that we have was, was not in the right shape. It was not in the shape of arrays of entities. So it didn't make any sense for us to do it. So it, you know, this is not a, every single NGRX project should immediately convert over to this approach. Yep. Um, that is not the, the message here, but if your data is of the shape where you have, where you have these arrays, it could save you uh, writing, time, save you time writing the code. And then if you have big arrays that are searched a lot, then it can save you uh, time for your users. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. So Lance, I would like to, to just kind of expand on that question a little bit or what you just said so you would not start out with entity right out the gate even if you were a small lab even though you would gain writing less code as one of your efficiencies you would base it on your array size is that what i understood at this point um if i were if i ever had to write this code even if my array only had three elements i would still switch over to entity because I'd rather write one line of code instead of those 15 lines. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. but you know, it wouldn't, there it would be the developer's efficiency and not the user's efficiency that would be gaining. Yeah, okay, thank you. Welcome. I've got another, uh, hopefully softball one. Uh, sure. how, how big is it? Like, does it add a lot of bytes to your application or is it like small enough you just don't really worry about it? I'm pretty sure it's small enough that I don't worry about it, but I have not actually looked. Let's see. Um. Uh, bundle phobia shows 1.9 kilobyte gzip. So, so how much? Uh, 1.9 kilobyte gzip. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, two two kilobytes uh, gzip. So I'm. It's not something I'd worry about too much. Yeah, that's pretty small. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So um, I'm gonna show one other thing that uh, that I. Uh, forgot to mention, um, let's see, give me a second here. Yeah, so one question that could come up is what if your IDs are not called ID? In this case, I just said, you know, the property, the ID property for both users and posts was ID and that's the default. And so that just works fine. But what if you have it under a different name? And uh, 
to get around that, the create entity adapter takes an object and its constructor that uh, has a couple options. And one of them is select ID. And here we could say select post and I want you to return post.id, or it could be whatever the name of it is. And so this way, if you happen to have another name for the thing that you have in there, it's just this one line arrow function to say, give it a different ID. Or, you know, this is how you find an ID by a different name. So uh, that it's, they, they thought of that, which is nice. Any other questions from anybody? I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed by, uh, by, by the participation. It's been really great. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Okay, well, you wanna sign off Lance? I think we're out of questions. All right, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Again, as I said at the beginning, uh, if you liked what you learned about NGRX here and you wanna learn more, we are teaching a class, I believe in the middle of September, it's a two day class. Um, otherwise, we'll come back to the next Angular Lunch and we'll teach you something else. Thanks. <laughs>